Uh, Marion Kaplan is a Skirball professor of modern Jewish history and professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at New York University. She earned her BA from uh, Douglas College, a part of Rutgers University, and went on to do her uh, master's and PhD degrees at Columbia University. Uh, I'm now gonna crib some notes from Noel, who kindly provided them before his untimely in injury. Uh, to explain that Professor Kaplan approaches her uh, Jewish history from the perspectives of gender history and the history of everyday life. She has authored or edited numerous books in, the, in this area, including The Making of the Jewish Middle Class, Women, Family, and Identity in Imperial Germany, as well as uh, uh, Jewish Daily Life in Germany, uh, 1618 to 1945, and she's a co-editor of uh, Gender and Jewish History. Her book, uh, Beyond Dignity and Despair, Jewish Life in Nazi Germany, uh, is the second of her books to win the National Jewish Book Award. It is an analysis of how Jewish women and families were desocialized out of everyday life in pre-war and wartime Germany. A recent book by uh, Professor Kaplan was again a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award entitled Dominican Haven, the Jewish Ref Refugees uh, Settlement in Sosua, 1940 to 1945. Published by the Museum of uh, Jewish Heritage in New York, uh, it accompanies and expands upon an exhibit there. Uh, and I know that some uh, students uh, also here tonight from Professor Kiros, Karaskios' uh, Latin American history class has been reading that book. Uh, so tonight's uh, talk is entitled Jewish Life in Nazi Germany. Noel wanted me to uh, uh, emphasize one very distinctive point about uh, 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 Professor Kaplan's approach. Uh, he, he said it's so rich in uh, detail about uh, the actual daily lives of people. So I'm looking forward very much to your talk tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And I apologize if some of you have had to read too much Kaplan these days. I know you've been assigned it, so I hope it has been not too painful. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is Jewish women and families in Nazi Germany and how they struggled with change as it came along somewhat gradually at the beginning and then pretty quickly after uh, the November pogrom, which some people call Kristallnacht. With the Nazi seizure of power, Germany's approximately 500,000 Jews, which is under 1% of the population, tiny little group, uh, began to uh, struggle for daily survival forced into a process of separation and then segregation, which took about six years. Nazi repression occurred in irregular and unpredictable steps, despite what may appear to us in hindsight to be the increasing speed and clarity of persecution, Nazi policy followed what has been described as a, quote, twisted road to Auschwitz. Contradictory pronouncements, regional variations, lack of coordination, and the attempt to appear moderate to other nations gave contemporaries profoundly mixed signals. For Jews, the concept of normal, and I always use that kind of in quotes, became increasingly elastic even as conditions worsened. As memoirs, my most important sources indicate, some Jews longed to make life normal within the ever-narrowing boundaries drawn by the Nazis. Others denied what they saw happening. For many, there was a combination of both at the same time. The desire and need to believe that they and their families could remain in their homeland, even under new and trying conditions. Jewish women in particular played a crucial role in this process of creating normalcy, both in the home and in the family, in highly abnormal situations, while also assessing the mixed signals and pressing hardest for emigration. Now first, the mixed signals, what were they? And I'm gonna talk about social ostracism and economic decline. Those are the two areas that I think are most pr profound and most pronounced at that time. One of the first signs of a new era was the disassociation of former friends. Memoirs are replete with personal disappointments. One woman reported she had stopped attending a monthly coffee session, not wanting to embarrass her non-Jewish friends. One day she met one of the women on the street who assured her that they missed her and they wanted her to join them. However, when she arrived at the coffee shop, no one was there. So much for loyalty. But she wrote, quote, I couldn't blame them. 
Why should they have risked the loss of their jobs only to prove to me that Jews could still have friends in Germany? Moreover, she seemed to understand the processes at work. In early April 1933, she had expressed delight at the constancy of her non-Jewish friends. But, quote, with each day of the Nazi regime, the abyss between us and our fellow citizens became larger. Friends whom we had loved for years didn't know us anymore. And while most avoided them, others outright barred them from previous social gatherings. Many organizations swiftly Nazified themselves, expelling Jewish members even before the government forced them to. Philosopher Hannah Arendt reflected, quote, our friends Nazified themselves. The problem, after all, was not what our enemies did, but what our friends did. Now, I have to say, of course, she's only partly right. Of course, it was also what their enemies did. But the fact is that she focuses on how sad it was that old friends would turn their backs. Of course, not all Germans abandoned their Jewish friends. Acts of simple neighborly decency, as little as a good morning greeting, came as a great relief. They meant there were good Germans, and some included uh, those who would say a kind word from a next door neighbor, a kind inquiry. Um, that always gave us hope and confidence, one woman wrote. It was often precisely an experience of loyalty, a friend who came by ostentatiously, the former classmate who shook hands with a Jewish woman in a crowded store that gave Jews mixed messages, letting some deceive themselves into staying. But the government intended to completely isolate Jews and, as one woman wrote, quote, after some months of a regime of terror, fidelity and friendship lost their meaning and fear and treachery replaced them. By 1936, the Nazis had brought off a deepening of the gap between Jews and other Germans. Companionship with non-Jews became a rare exception. General social ostracism accompanied the loss of friends. As Germans began to treat each other with reserve, they broke decisively with Jews. And again, here I want to add something, which is it's not just that Germans broke away from Jews. Germans broke away from each other because uh, fear and the government's and government uh, uh, laws and regulations and decrees began to make Germans worry about their own safety among each other, not just about Jews. So I think that's very important. The government first cracked down on communists and socialists, not on Jews. And so that, those were huge parties in uh, the Weimar Republic. So a lot of people were in danger before Jews. Uh, but now to get back to the focus on Jews. Neighbors turned away most abruptly in small towns and villages where about 20% of Jews still lived. In one southern town, a Jewish woman and her non-Jewish neighbor had spent the previous 20 years gardening in plots next to each other. As a result of Germany's new mood, they no longer spoke or gardened near each other. I suspect the decline of sociability in the neighborhood affected Jewish women more than men because they were more accustomed to neighborly exchanges and courtesies. Their lives encompassed the community. Highly organized and active in communal, volunteer, and women's organizations, women suffered openly, verbally, and later in their memoirs when they were ostracized. Now, I've spoken about um, friends and neighbors, and now I want to talk about strangers. Strangers also made life miserable. On trams, in stores, and on the street, they tested their knowledge of who smelled or looked Jewish and mortified their victims by pronouncing their suspicions loudly. Some Germans claimed such keen olfactory senses that they could identify Jews by their garlic smell. Germans' long-standing aversion to garlic, really an antipathy to things foreign, became a favorite way of tormenting German Jews, a group whose own aversion to garlic was just as strong as that of Germans. The Jewish victims of these verbal assaults met with shrill complaints on the streetcar. It smells like garlic here, or it smells like Jews. And for those of you who've ever traveled to Germany, you know that now the haute cuisine is garlic, so that it's really quite ironic that it, it's come about to be that garlic is very in and very cool. And still, despite the irregular but irreversible, irreversible ostracism, mixed signals continued. In 1933, a 10-year-old observed Nazi mar Nazis marching with placards reading, Germans don't buy from Jews. World Jewry wants to destroy Germany. 
But in 1935, her father was still decorated for active service in the past war, receiving a citation signed by the chief of police of Berlin. Even later, a Jewish boy was encouraged by his school principal to take Latin rather than the more practical English for potential emigrants. The same principal who gave copies of Hitler's Mein Kampf, Hitler's famous sort of autobiography political tract, um, to his graduating class, convinced the boy and his father that there would always be a place for such a good student in Germany. Of course, he wound up with Latin and wound up in Denver, Colorado. Moreover, random kindnesses, the most obvious mixed signals, gave some Jews cause for hope. One woman wrote that every Jewish person knew a decent German and recalled that many Jews thought, quote, the radical Nazi laws would never be carried out because they didn't match the moderate character of the German people. Finally, it's worth recalling that much like other Germans, Jews didn't understand that Hitler was an entirely new leader. Historian Fritz Stern noted that most Germans saw in him a caricature of something old and known. They adjusted him to their own limited imagination. In other words, they thought this was a cruder form of a Bismarck, or this was a cruder and more violent, more vehement Kaiser. But they couldn't imagine, um, as no one probably could have, that this man was completely off the spectrum. This was also the case for German Jews. At worst, they expected a return to some form of earlier pre-emancipation status. They did not and could not predict their end. Now economic problems began to set in rapidly and to seriously affect the Jewish population. The loss of jobs and businesses threatened economic survival. And here, unlike the social tr situation, the trend, with very few exceptions, was downhill. German Jews had been a predominantly middle class group, heavily represented in business fields and in the free professions. Germans call it the free professions. That's usually law, medicine, journalism, things like that. On April 1st, 1933, the German government declared a boycott of all Jewish businesses. Although this boycott was called off after one day, it frightened Jews and continued unofficially and sporadically throughout the 1930s until the Nazis completely Aryanized, that's their word, or confiscated Jewish businesses. Immediately after the so-called April Laws of 1933, about half of Jewish judges and prosecutors and almost a third of Jewish lawyers lost their jobs. A fourth of Jewish doctors lost their German national health insurance affiliation. In September, the Nazis excluded Jews from the worlds of art, film, music, literature, and journalism. Restrictions, official and unofficial harassment, and economic boycotts all increased in frequency and fervor. Now, obviously, non-Jews benefited from Jewish misfortunes. Jewish mom and pop shops, reeling from boycotts, blackmail, and threats, were compelled to sell out to local comp competitors for well under their worth. By 1936, the Nazis declared many areas of small business, particularly those associated with agriculture, as free of Jews, or the German word is Judenrein, sort of means clean of Jews. Professionals profited from Jewish distress as well. In 1933 in Prussia, for example, 1% of male teachers and 4.5% of female teachers were fired. These dismissals provided a convenient method by which the government found teaching assignments for 1,300 Aryan job applicants in 1933. Similarly, the dismissal of Jews in the Prussian civil administration affected 12 to 15% of jobs. The medical profession, amidst vicious competition among doctors, was among the most eager to rid itself of Jewish competitors. Dr. Henrietta Nicholas Magnus described the crude tactics of non-Jewish doctors in her neighborhood who, eager to absorb her practice, told her patients she had killed herself. There seems to have been little public complaint and silent approval about the ousting of Jews. In Hamburg, for example, Lotta Popper's friendly non-Jewish neighbor told her that her daughter had chosen one of two suitors, the assistant judge. And here's the quote. Now he has the best prospect to achieve something in court where they're firing so many people. 
Mrs. Hansen stifled the word Jews and calmly expounded at great length upon her daughter's happy future. Even anti-Nazis like Thomas Mann, whose wife was Jewish, approved of these measures. Quote, it's no great misfortune that the Jewish presence in the judiciary has been ended, end quote. Although he worried about his, quote, secret troubling thoughts, he was very ha happy when Alfred Kerr, a well-known Berlin critic who had often attacked Mann's work, lost his job. Selfish motives played an important role with Mann as with others. Unemployment began to plague the Jewish community. In 1933, about two-thirds of Jewish salaried, uh, salaried employees worked in Jewish businesses. With the disappearance of many Jewish firms, joblessness among Jewish employees became rampant. By the spring of 33, that's only four months into the Nazi regime, uh, nearly one-third of Jewish clerks were looking for jobs. Jewish sources estimated that three quarters of Jewish women in business and trade were affected by the discriminatory laws and the early anti-Nazi, anti-Jewish boycotts. As many as 33% of Jews in Germany received some form of public welfare by 1935. And again, you have to remember this is a middle class group, so for them to be uh, in need of welfare is a, a huge uh, drop in their financial uh, security. By April 38, over 60% of all Jewish businesses no longer existed, and Jewish social workers were trying to help 60,000 unemployed people. Jewish economic futures looked as bleak as the present, although young women's chances of some sort of employment were often better than those of men. The exclusion of Jews from German universities also restricted employment. Even new admissions in trade and vocational schools were limited, to 1.5% non-Aryans. Again, in other words, right after high school, these kids had no future. There was no vocational training, there was no commercial training, there was no university training. So how did this work out in the family? And now I want to turn to the increasing stress and what I call stress management in the family. In the face of progressively worsening living conditions, women were supposed to make things work in the household. Here, memoirs are richly supplemented by Jewish family newspapers. The League of Jewish Women, which was a, it's the, the Jewish feminist movement in Germany, characteristically urged women to absorb all of the stress. They're not really feminists by today's standards. It is the duty of the Jewish woman to regulate the household so that everyone is satisfied. Cooking seemed to take a preeminent role among issues causing stress because of tight budgets, limited help, and the difficulties of acquiring kosher meat for some. Housewives were advised to consider vegetarian menus because they were cheaper and healthier. Although meat was easier to prepare and demanded less time, women were told that, quote, goodwill is an important assistant in a vegetarian kitchen. And newspapers printed vegetarian menus and recipes. After the Nuremberg Laws, which forbade the hiring of Aryan household help under the age of 45, a further handicap for some housewives. The, one of the Jewish newspapers ran articles entitled, Everyone Learns to Cook, or Even Peter Cooks. These articles emphasized how children, sons and daughters, but particularly daughters, could help their mothers. Husbands were expected to pitch in only minimally. More typically, husbands were requested to limit their expectations and to restrain their criticism if the meals were not what they used to be. To lighten women's load, newspapers ceaselessly urged housewives to organize, streamline, and cut back on household tasks. Again, one Jewish newspaper introduced Frank Gilbreth, the American efficiency expert. Does anybody know who Frank Gilbreth is? None of the younger people. Cheaper by the dozen? You see the movie? Okay, Cheaper by the Dozen, the book is by Frank Gilbreth because he actually did have 12 children. And in order to have, because he had 12 children and didn't want to go crazy, he had to be, become very, very efficient. And so he became literally a, an efficiency expert, first in his own home and then in industry. And that's where you get that funny movie from. But the book's better. Anyway, Frank Gilbreth was on all the women's pages of the Jewish newspapers, uh, which suggested that their circumstances had drastically changed. Articles offered Gilbreth's guidance regarding kitchen design, which was ways of making a smaller kitchen more practical. 
They included pointers on how to save steps and hand motions, how to complete two tasks at once, and supposedly how to prevent exhaustion. Advice columns urged women to hire daily or hourly help where possible. In what must have been desperation, leaders advised that even young men be hired to help in the household. And there was a, young, a small group in Berlin called the Maccabees, and they were young men who were supposed to help out in the household, but they were usually found reading a book behind a bookcase, so that didn't work. It was a big failure. It was kind of funny. <laughs> but the household was only the first of familial crises. The regime challenged existing marriages and family relations. In 1933, there were about 35,000 mixed marriages by religion. In addition, there were what the Nazis would see as racially mixed marriages, those in which the two partners might be Christian or non-denominational, but one partner had Jewish parents. Again, that would be a case in which, let's say there was a Catholic and a Catholic, or Catholic and a Protestant, but the parents had been Jewish, so the regime considered that individual Jewish. Early on, Nazi leaders demanded that mixed marriages be forbidden. Even after the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, which forbade intermarriage and sexual intercourse between Aryans and non-Aryans, Aryan men who feared the loss of their jobs initiated pro forma divorces. But after those laws, if they continued to live with their wives, they were guilty of racial shame or miscegenation, which could land them in jail. While the Nuremberg Laws forbade future intermarriages, they also cast opprobrium on those already in existence. Moreover, the government stepped up its harassment of these couples. In July 1938, a revised marriage law made it easier for mixed marriages to divorce. The regime exerted severe pressure on the non-Jewish partner to leave her or his mate. And in a typically racist and sexist manner, couples in which the husband was Aryan were treated better than those in which the wife was Aryan. And divorces between Aryan and non-Aryan spouses did occur, although most stayed together. Divorce could mean death to the Jewish spouse, no longer protected by a connection to an Aryan. The Nuremberg Laws were only the beginning in a series of court decisions regarding family life, such as intermarriage, divorce, adoption, and foster care. The new laws threatened family ties between parents and children. Aryan foster children could be taken from families where even one parent was Jewish. Moreover, the courts had declared that, quote, it was unacceptable from a national socialist viewpoint for a non-Aryan child to be brought um, uh, up among Aryan foster parents. Further, after the Nuremberg Laws, adoptions of, again, racially, in their sense of the word, different children were no longer permitted. Family stress often overlap with new jobs, new apartments, new cities in which to live. Many Jewish women who had never worked outside the home before now turned to the job market. Some didn't have to look far. They worked for husbands who, facing economic decline, had let their paid help go. Not unlike their grandmothers, these women helped out in their husbands' shops, offices, or practices. Articles in papers commented on finding, quote, relatively few families in which the wife does not work in some ways to earn a living and noted that women were also sole supports in many families. Statistics indicate that women eagerly sought opportunities to train for new careers or retrain where old careers didn't work anymore. They appeared more versatile and adaptable and had fewer inhibitions than men, were willing to change their lives to fit the times and were willing to enter retraining programs in old, at older ages than men. In Berlin, for example, Jewish employment services were far more successful in placing women than in placing men. As the job market narrowed, so did the opportunities for young people, another factor in increasing family stress. Teenagers were forced to reevaluate their options, in other words, to change their former career plans with all the pain and disappointment that entailed. The choices available to girls were more limited, if you exclude housework, than those for boys. Welfare organizations suggested sewing-related jobs for women. 
whereas men could consider many more options, including becoming painters, billboard designers, upholsterers, shoemakers, dyers, tailors, or skilled industrial workers. By mid-1935, the apprenticeship offices for Jewish girls reported that every second young woman aimed to be a seamstress. Before 1933, these same young women and men would have looked forward to business or professional careers. Parents seemed more likely to go along with boys' choices also of crafts or agricultural training, useful, for example, in Palestine. And then there were those parents who preferred to keep girls home altogether, either to shelter them from unpleasant work or to help around the house. Jewish papers urged families to provide some household training to their daughters for possible future employment. But the old-fashioned idea that girls would not require a career because they would marry lingered on in some families, even as that fantasy became more and more inconsistent with reality. Their normal middle-class lives and expectations overturned. Jewish families embarked on new paths and had to embrace new strategies that they would, in all likelihood, never have thought of. For women, this meant new roles as partner, breadwinner, family protector, and defender of the business pra or practice, roles that were often very strange to them and which they recorded with the apprehension they felt at the time. Increasingly, women found themselves representing or defending their men, their husbands, their fathers, their sons or brothers. Many tales have been recorded of women who saved family members from the Gestapo, the secret police. In these cases, it was always assumed the Nazis would not break gender norms. They might arrest or torture Jewish men, but they would not harm women. Thus, traditional gender norms afforded women greater freedom at first and they regularly mediated between the state and the family. They were able to manipulate the system slightly and consequently took on more and more assertive roles in the public sphere than ever before. In one small town, for example, a Jewish family sent its women to the city hall in order to ask that part of their house not be used as a meeting place for the Nazi party. Other women interceded for family members with German immigration or financial officials. In some cases, they not only broke gender barriers, but also normal standards of legality. Many memoirs report that Nazis had to be bribed and that despite their original shock at such requirements, women quickly handed over the necessary goods and money. Women also took on more demanding tasks. Some actually took responsibility for the entire family's safety. One woman traveled to Palestine to assess the situation there. Her husband, who couldn't leave Germany, simply told her, if you decide you'd like to live in Palestine, I'll like it too. She chose Greece. Her husband, older and more educated than she, who in other circumstances would have always been the decision maker, agreed. Another woman went to England to negotiate her family's emigration with British officials and medical colleagues. Her daughter noted it was thanks to her pertinacity and determination that we were able to leave Germany when we did. And it was always a great source of pride to her that it was she who obtained the permit letting us come to England. This is an, actually an interesting case because the dad was a doctor and the mom was a psychologist and England didn't want doctors. They didn't want doctors because the doctors there didn't want competition from other medical practitioners. But they needed psychologists and so they were willing to let the psychologist in and then she could bring the doctor along but he didn't get his permission for a long time. Women often found themselves also in threatening situations in which their bravery benefited from luck. 20-year-old Ruth Abraham regularly accompanied her father to the Gestapo for weekly interrogations. When her uncle was arrested, she hurried from jail to jail until she found his location. Then she appealed to a judge who released him. So sometimes luck ha helped as well. Sometimes you found a sympathetic person who was willing to go the extra inch. Women, women's new roles may have increased stress in some cases, but in general, both women and men appreciated the importance of the new behavior. Women forced themselves to behave in, quote, unwomanly ways, some putting up a strong front when men lost it. It is striking that in the testimony of both men and women, women's calm, dry-eyed state in the midst of turmoil is emphasized. 
One woman remembering how painful it had been to give up prized family heirlooms to the Nazis, reflected on the dignity and self-control of the Jews around her. I was glad that the Jews I saw behaved well. They didn't show any excitement noticeable to strangers. Now, what does this mean, this desire to seem calm? Um, I was wondering about that myself, and that's where I got the title, Between Dignity and Despair, that word dignity. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing, I'm thinking that it came from several different sources. Partly, it was a result of middle-class upbringing in the face of what they perceived as the Nazi rabble, an attempt also by Jews to retain their and their family's dignity in the face of persecution, an assertion of Jewish pride in the face of German Aryan savagery, and possibly also a proclamation of female stalwartness to counter the stereotype of female frailty. In any of these cases, it's noted by both women and men that women kept those kinds of um, emotional distances. Probably men took this kind of behavior of themselves for granted, whereas women previously allowed and encouraged to be the more emotional sex were particularly conscious of their efforts at self-control. And now I'd like to switch to, as the conditions worsened, what were the um, attitudes toward emigration? How did Jews kind of uh, begin to understand what, what was happening? And you'll notice I will never use the word the writing was on the wall, because I don't think it was. But we can talk about that later. Emigration, which became more and more crucial as time wore on, was skewed toward men. Yet women usually saw the danger signals first and urged their husbands to leave Germany. One woman's memoir noted that in a discussion among friends about a doctor who had just fled in the spring of 1936, most of the men in the room condemned him. Quote, the women protested strongly. They found it took more courage to go than to stay. All the women, without exception, shared this opinion, while the men more or less passionately spoke against it. The different attitudes of men and women described here might reflect a gender-specific reaction remarked upon by sociologists and psychologists. In dangerous situations, men tend to, quote, stand their ground, whereas women avoid conflict, preferring flight as a strategy. But I think a far more important reason why women were more amenable to emigration than their husbands is that men felt responsible as family breadwinners. How would they support their families in a new country? Conversely, women were less tied to the public worlds of jobs or businesses. Women were less assimilated than men into the German economy or culture. Although their decision to leave was as fraught with practical consequences as their husbands, since they too would face uncertainty and poverty, women did not have to tear themselves from their life work whether a business, a professional practice, whether patients or clients or colleagues. In short, in light of men's primary identity with their work, they often felt trapped into staying. Women whose identity was more family-oriented struggled to preserve what was central to them by fleeing with it. Men and women also led relatively distinct lives, and they often interpreted daily events differently. Although less integrated than men into work and culture, women were more integrated into their communities. There were the daily pleasantries with neighbors, occasional visits to the school, attendance at concert, concerts and local lectures, and often participation in local women's organizations. Raised to be sensitive to interpersonal behavior and social situations, women's social antenna were finely tuned. They registered the increasing hostility of their immediate surroundings, unmitigated by a promising business prospect, a deep feeling for German culture as experienced by their more educated husbands, or the patriotism of husbands who had fought in World War I. In contrast, men mediated their experiences through newspapers and broadcasts. Carol Gilligan's psychological theories may apply here. Men tended to view their situation in terms of abstract rights, women in terms of actual affiliations and relationships. And to give you a very cr concrete example, um, one of the judges uh, of the, of, uh, one of the German judges who was Jewish was uh, confronted by his wife who said, 
that their son, I'm forgetting his name now, had been beaten up on the way home from school. And he sat there and he was reading the paper and he said, yes, I understand and that's terrible, but you know, the government is saying that such and such is happening and that's all that's gonna happen. So he's really clinging to kind of the legal or the governmental decree or statement. And she's saying, hey, Johnny got beaten up on the way from school. So it's, it's a different kind of um, information gathering, I think, is what, what I see a lot of in that period. Women's subordinate status in the public world and their focus on the household may have made them also more amenable to the kinds of work they would have to perform in places of refuge. In England and the United States, for example, refugee wives frequently made do working as domestic servants while husbands attempted to reestablish businesses or professional careers. Summing up, Peter Wyden recalled the debates within his own and other Berlin Jewish families, quote, it wasn't a bit unusual in these go or no go family dilemmas for the women to display more energy and enterprise than the men. Almost no, women, no woman had a business, a law office, or a medical practice to lose. They were less status conscious, less money oriented, less cautious, more confident of their ability to flourish on new turf. Now, even given these gender differences in picking up warning signals, it is crucial to recognize that these signals occurred in stages and that the tipping point only came after the November pogrom of 1938, known as Crystal Night, when Nazi mobs burned synagogues and the police arrested over 30,000 Jewish men and sent them to concentration camps. Alice Nowen and her friends saw that it was getting worse, but until Kristallnacht, Nobody in our circle believed it would lead to an end. In addition, it's extremely important to remember that perceptions, and I've been just talking about perceptions now for the last five minutes, that perceptions by women or men were not the only factors affecting emigration. The writing was not clearly on the wall. That conclusion emerges largely with hindsight. In the 1930s, Nazi deception and cynical dishonesty served the purpose of tranquilizing many in the Jewish community. But the major obstacle, the major obstacle to underline to Jewish emigration lay in the restrictions of foreign countries against immigrants. So whatever we say about perceptions might be interesting, might be gendered, might be also generational because young people, people your age, want it out and their parents often felt more connected to running their business or being breadwinners or staying in Germany because they thought they understood it better. Uh, so generations differed as well. But all of this perception doesn't matter. What really, really matters, the doors were closed. Okay, having said this about a gender analysis of the desire to emigrate, um, that highlights women's different expectations, priorities, and perceptions. It doesn't follow, however, that more women than men actually left. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. Why? There were still compelling reasons to stay, although life became increasingly difficult. First, women, especially young women, could still find jobs in the Jewish sector of the German economy much more easily than men. They could the Jewish community started to build a more and more welfare institutions, daycare, old age homes, soup kitchens, and those were er areas in which uh, young women were hired to take care of uh, the people who needed help. While the employment situation of Jewish women helped keep them in Germany, that of men helped get them out. Some husbands or sons had business connections abroad, facilitating their immediate flight and others emigrated alone in order to establish themselves and then send for their families. So the idea was we'll send the dad, we'll send the, father, the, the brother, and then we'll, they'll bring over the rest of the family. Another compelling reason why more women remained behind was the fact that before the war, men faced more physical danger than women and were forced to flee. In a strange twist of fortune, the men arrested during the November pogrom 
were released from concentration camps only upon showing proof of their ability to depart from Germany immediately. In other words, those men brutalized in concentration camps in November 38, 39, were lucky, in, in quotes, because if their wives or sisters could get emigration papers for them, they got out and they had to leave the country within two to three weeks. So some of those men got out while their wives said, well, we'll clean up and we'll follow up, you know, we'll follow you. But then they didn't get out because the bureaucracy dragged on and then the war started. Further, as more and more sons left, daughters remained as sole caretakers for their parents, elderly parents. One female commentator noted that she knew of a whole slew of young women who cannot think of emigration because they don't know who might care for their mother in the interim before they could start sending her money. In the same families, the sons went their way. As early as 1936, the League of Jewish Women saw cause for serious concern regarding the special problem of the emigration of women. In January 38, another uh, emigration organization announced, quote, up to now Jewish emigration indicates a severe surplus of men. This organization suggested that couples marry before emigrating, encouraged women to prepare themselves as household helpers, and promised that women's emigration would become a priority, which in that year it didn't. Another drawback in the emigration of women was the lack of financial support available to them. It seems as though fewer women than men received support from Jewish organizations in order to emigrate. And fewer women went to Palestine. Between 1933 and 36, more German Jews went to Palestine than to any other country. Emigration consultants encouraged young women to consider Palestine as a possible refuge and to take up the adventures of kibbutz life. Kibbutz being these uh, cooperative farms, communal farms, that were uh, well known in that period of time and have since faded out in Israel. Yet articles appear on Palestine, often written by committed Zionists, that must have given cause, a pause. Sorry. In one such presentation, the male author described a situation in which eight girls took care of 55 young men. Besides cooking, they washed, quote, mountains of laundry, darned hundreds of socks, sewed ripped clothing, working long days and into the night. Additionally, numerous news items regarding Arab Jewish discord doubtless left most young women looking elsewhere for refuge. One survey of graduating classes from several Jewish schools in late 1935 showed about half of the boys, but only 30% of girls considering Palestine. The growing disproportion of Jewish women in the German Jewish population also resulted from the fact there were more Jewish women than men in Germany to begin with. In order to stay even, a greater absolute number of women would have had to emigrate. And why were there more Jewish women? World War I, uh, emig emigration of the men, and Jew women live longer than men, so we're talking about mostly elderly widows as well who, are, who stay on. Oh, and men intermarry and convert more than women. And although the conversion shouldn't have mattered, it, the intermarriage could save their lives and they could either stay or they could leave, but they were no longer in the Jewish population. They were now in the Christian population. The slow rate of female emigration meant that the female proportion of the Jewish population rose from 52% in 33 to 58% by 39. Looking around in 1939, one woman wrote, quote, mostly we were women who had been left to ourselves. In part, our husbands had died from shock or in a concentration camp. And partly, there were wives who, aware of the greater danger to their husbands, prevailed upon the men to leave at once and alone. They were ready to follow their husbands, but it became impossible. And quite a few became martyrs of Hitler. Thus women, but elderly women in particular, remain behind in disproportionate numbers. The combination of age and gender was lethal. When Elizabeth Freund, who took the last train out of Germany in 1941, went to the Gestapo for her emigration papers, she observed all old people, old women, waiting online. Thank you.
Thank you. Now I'm happy to take questions, comments, thoughts, whatever. Not all at once. Yeah. That's a bit, did everybody hear the question? Uh, to what extent did these role reversals affect Jewish women and men long term once they had left Germany, those who survived and wound up in emigration, let's say in the United States or England, for example? Um, there's a part I left out of here because I didn't want to run over, and that was that um, most of the Jewish newspapers, including the feminist newspapers, I mean, when you, I say feminist, they were part of the women's movement, but they were hardly feminist by the way we would announce, think about it today or describe it today, all considered women's new roles, new public roles as emergency measures. And the reason for that is because these were such unsettling times that they just, I think they just wanted to deny gender role reversal because that would have made it more unsettling. So they simply would go over and over the, the situation, say these women are all working now and husbands should keep their criticism minimal and maybe help out a little and, uh, you know, the, the Hausfrau would return to being a Hausfrau after things got better. Now, what actually happened, okay, that's the language, what actually happened, I think is pretty interesting because um, I'm pretty familiar with the German Jewish refugee communities in New York City, uh, in Washington Heights, which is near the George Washington Bridge, and also in the Upper West Side, which is near Columbia University, for example, for those of you who know the city. Um, I would say that as soon as they got there, those women had to work too. They were cleaning ladies. They were uh, sales ladies in stores. They had very, uh, their jobs were very, very necessary because they were trying to get the family back on its feet. After a number of years though, many of them stopped doing that when their husbands were able to create a lower middle class lifestyle. So at that point, the women stopped working. Um, I can't really judge whether the women remained as deferential to the men as they had been in Germany. Um, I'm not sure Jewish women were ever that deferential to their men. I'm just not sure. Um, I would be surprised if they were, uh, but that might just be a stereotype, so I can't answer that. In England, the same thing happens, though. In England, they also become domestic servants. They become uh, you know, low-level employees, and then after numbers of years, they also retire into the home. So that much I know. So that's a partial answer. Hi. I think all three. I, I don't know if you all heard that. Whether it was fear, the German bystanders, was it fear? Did they believe in the legality or did they buy the propaganda? That's, those are the three areas, right? Um, I think it's all of the three, but I think it's also, you could chronologically um, work on that as well. You could say, why did most Germans in 33, it's not true, why did 40% of Germans in 33 vote Nazi? Not most. 40% max. And the answer is the depression. It's none of the above, all right? It's the depression, the uh, anger at the loss of World War I, the feeling that they had been cheated in the Treaty of Versailles, all of those things combined. I mean, there's nationalism, all of that. Um, but then once the Nazis get into power and the propaganda machine starts, you do find really interesting changes of heart, even among friends of Jews, where suddenly they are becoming anti-Semites and they are believing. I mean, if you have a government without a free press, it's, you know, and you're getting 
slammed with this uh, propaganda all the time, there was a kind of change of um, attitude toward Jews. I would say that. I, wouldn't, I don't know whether they all believed the propaganda, but there was a change of attitude. And then, of course, fear sets in as well because it was a police state. So in a very nice book by Frances Henry called Victims and Neighbors, um, she goes, she's an anthropologist from Canada, and she goes back to this small town in the Rhineland and interviews people, and they let her interview them because she was the baby, the grandchild of the doctor they had all known. So she gets an in into the uh, society, and she describes that during Kristallnacht, during the pogrom, when, you know, some, uh, one of the ladies opens up her, one of the non-Jewish women op opens up her uh, shutters, sees Jews running away from a mob, shuts the shutters and gets under her blanket because she's frightened for herself. And a lot of people thought that after the Jews comes me, who the me was. And, and I assume you know this because Germany was not just an anti-Semitic state, it was a racial state. And the first people that the Germans murdered were disabled people. You know, the T4 program was uh, gas chambers for disabled people. So there were the families of disabled people. Then there were the Roma and the Sinti, sometimes called gypsies, so that you have that too. Um, and they were also herded into concentration camps in 1936 during the Olympics, right outside of Berlin, a place called Marzahn. And it's so incredible when you're coming from the airport, you go right past that station, you know, and kind of think, this is a real place, and they used to have a camp here for gypsies. So, it, you know, we're talking about a racial state, not just an anti-Semitic state, a state in which Aryans had certain duties and rights. Um, the men were to be fighters, and, of course, businessmen and industrialists, and the women were supposed to be baby producers. You know, kinder, kirche, kirche, children, kitchen, church. So um, I think Aryans were pretty much... Uh, they were forced into a line also, so, and I think fear plays a big role. However, having said that, there's a book by Robert Gelately called uh, The Gestapo in German Society, and he insists that the Gestapo was a very small organization, and the, Ger the German nation had become a nation of denouncers to, the same ex to such an extent that Hitler was upset that Germans were such denouncers, because people were denounced for anything. You know, I'm going to denounce not just Jews, I'm going to denounce my neighbor and say that he didn't give the salute because I want his apartment. I'm going to denounce so-and-so because he broke up with me. I mean, it was like all kinds of denunciations. So I think it was not just fear, but it was also denunciation. You didn't know whom to trust. That's why I said very, I, I interrupted myself and said Germans started be acting with reserve against other Germans because they didn't know who to trust. And what was the third one? Now I'm forgetting. There was the propaganda... The legality, I think it's interesting. Um, I think that's an important question. The Nazis wanted it to be legal. They wanted it to appear legal. So they have the Enabling Act. And then they have close to a thousand decrees. I don't know if you consider a decree legal, but decrees about Jews. You know, and, and everything is done in a form, and, and there are judges, and there are juries, and you know, so there, there is the form. There's a very nice book by a German philosopher, po political scientist, uh, Ernst Frankel. Those of you who study philosophy may have come across him, F-R-A-N-K-L. It's called the dual state. And this dual state was the normative state, which was like the old-fashioned state. It had bureaucracy, it had judges, it had juries. And then there was the, what he calls, prerogative state, it was the state that dictated and that had its own courts, like the folks court. You know, they were different courts and different, uh, and, and the Gestapo, which, you know, whatever the state said, the Gestapo could do the opposite. So, you know, there's a way in which there was a kind of legalism, but it was not from the old system. It was from its, a new system. It's a great question. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions or ideas about it? Yeah. Physically? <coughs> Vic victims? Victims? 
Okay, so this is a question about resistance, like women in resistance or women fighting back. So then the first thing I have to ask is what is resistance? Okay, now if resistance means guns, then women didn't do it, men didn't do it, Jews didn't do it, socialists didn't do it, communists didn't do it, nobody did it, okay? Because it wasn't a society in which everybody could carry their gun with them. Um, and it wasn't a society in which, you know, the idea was that you'd get up on the barricades. So, you know, Jews didn't fight back in terms of guns, nor did anybody else. That's number one. If resistance includes maintaining an elan, maintaining your family, maintaining your community, then met Jewish men and women did it. I mean, there was, for example, one of the first things they did was to set up a cultural association. As soon as all the Jewish uh, musicians and actors and singers got thrown off the stage, Jews created their own cultural association and hired those people and then sent those people out to smaller villages where Jews lived and had nothing. So if you consider that con maintaining the spirit, and I would consider that resistance. Some of you might say it's rearranging, you know, deck chairs on the Titanic, which other people argue too. Uh, but I see it as human dignity. Again, that's where my, that word dignity comes in. What is resistance? Is resistance uh, submitting to the kind of image the Nazis had of you, or is it to show yourselves and your children that you aren't those people? And I think, so I would consider that a form of resistance. Um, yeah, there were also a few Jewish men and women who actually resisted by um, putting up leaflets and things like that. There's the famous Baum group, B-A-U-M. They're mostly communists, but they put up uh, resistance leaflets all over Berlin and got caught, and most of them got murdered. Um, but not much of that, and certainly not much of that among communists or socialists either. So, yeah. To follow up on this point uh, yeah. that, that's just been raised uh, about resistance or the lack of resistance, um, it's something that you know has characterized the Jewish response not just during the early period, obviously, but also later on, uh, the advent of the war and all the thoughts of why they were characterized as being led to the slaughter of like, made a point to say that um, they didn't read the writing on the wall. Um, I said there was no writing on the wall. Good. Right. It's a very good point because it, it made me think that the other Bauer recently argued, for example, that even the final solution was not a pre-organized, laid out plan. It just seemed to kind of evolve. And even early on, if that's the case, if these decrees and other measures just kind of happen, as Crystal not kind of happen, uh, without the consent of the of even Hitler himself. Um, well, there, Goebbels knew about it. Goebbels, Goebbels did it, it. right. So if there was no writing on the wall, does that change uh, the perception of the Jewish family? Uh, basically, following up on the point you just made, as more of an act of resistance rather than a denial. Denying that this is actually happening, keeping a blind eye, that things have to improve. But you know, I can't answer that because this is like I'm a historian, and that's such a psychological question. My, okay. <laughs> so I would say it's both. I would say it's denial on the one hand, and it's we have to continue living our normal lives and having respect for ourselves, self-respect. And I think. One of the examples I often give, um, and it's not a good, great example, but it, it makes a point, is um, during 9-11, I of course live in New York City, so uh, the city was shattered and people were devastated and our children were sent home from school and so many parent mothers I know, I mean fathers came home too. What did the mothers do with the kids? They baked cookies and we brought them to the firefighters and the police, uh, un uh, not units, uh, police precincts. You know, so we got there, and there were like so many cakes on the floor, you couldn't believe it. Like the firefighters were laughing because these were these were guys who hadn't gone downtown, you know, who were staying in our neighborhood. But that's what we. Well, what does that mean? That shows you're on the one hand, you have children, you don't want to freak them out totally. So you pretend something's normal. You're kind of denying it, but you're not denying it. So it's, it's a mishmash. I can't 
pull it apart for you. You could probably pull it apart better. No, you can't either. Okay. It's a good question. I just don't have the answer for that. I do feel, though, that this issue of resistance being the Warsaw Ghetto, that I find that definition way too narrow, extremely narrow, and in kind of macho. Um, it's resistance by guns. And um, Deborah Dwork has often argued in her book, um, Children with a Star, the most resistance, the most successful resistance in Europe was sneaking children over the border and hiding children in the Dutch underground, in the French underground, putting, bringing them to Switzerland. If you want to count numbers, and mostly women but also men were involved in that, and it didn't take guns. So for me, resistance really has to be redefined. I mean, if you want to say guns, go ahead, say guns. I'm not going to deny that that's a form of resistance, but that's not the resistance, to me at least. I don't know, is that convincing? Yeah, Cynthia. Um, I absolutely agree with everything you've just said about resistance, but still I just wanted to press you on this point because your descriptions of the dignity and self-control of the Jews are so powerful and so beautifully written in your work. Um, and yet in those years after Kristallnacht, especially during you know, the, the ghetto life and as the deportations were going on and increasing in frequency, you know, Jewish writers like Hannah Arendt, you know, retrospectively, said that at some point, precisely those characteristics of those behaviors that helped, you know, show the nobility of spirit that was being preserved, you know, or the civilized values that were being preserved, were also exactly those qualities that, I don't know, and I hate to say it in these terms, but sort of endowed the population with a certain passivity or orderliness in the face of these uh, measures that were going to lead to their extinction. Right. I mean, the point here is, though, Arendt says, you know, why were they so organized? Why did they help the Nazis, you know, organize themselves, let, let, let themselves be organized? But, I mean, that's, number one, presuming that you know that they're being organized to go to death, which they didn't know. And number two, um, I think she's really looking at, in retrospect, I mean, and, and she... She was a single person at the time, and I don't know that she could imagine how you deal with family and how you deal with children and how you deal with old people. I just, you know, she, she had a mother, but her mother was, I think, in Switzerland. Her mother had gotten out. She was first in France. They were both in France, and the mother went to Switzerland. She got out through um, Lisbon. So um, I, I don't think she's right. That's in Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she, it's really rearranging chairs on the, uh, deck chairs on the Titanic. She's saying, they should have stopped, you know, playing their violin, and they should have beaten it out of there, beat it out of there. But it was very hard to beat it out of there. You needed visas, you needed exit visas, you needed an affidavit from the United States. You needed dozens of stamps, you know, of, of stamps from different bureaucracies before you could budge. You needed your ship tickets, you needed money, and the government kept taking more and more money, so there was less and less money with which to buy those ship tickets or to prove to the uh, British for Palestine or to the Americans for the United States that you had enough money to exist and you weren't going to become a public charge. That was always the issue of the affidavit. Someone had to sign a piece of paper that you, the refugee, were not going to become a public charge. So, I mean... You know, what can I say? I think Hannah Arendt's always very angry, you know, and I, it, she's right to be angry, but I think she's sometimes too angry at the Jews and not angry enough at the others. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Palestine, but um, weren't, weren't the German, Jewish Germans um, resistant to Zionism? Yes, but not after 1933. But after 1936, but between 1933 and 1936, what, what was there? In 1936, the, the Jewish Palestine, no, that's like 39, 38, 39. You mean the white paper, the British white paper? That's later. Um, 33 to 36, because um, that's the flow out of all the young Zionists. And by 33, Zionism is catching on very much among young people because they're being told they're no good. They're being told they come from a you know, terrible group of people. And, they, and Zionism gives them pride in themselves and in their heritage. And they get the idea, as young people might, that it would be fun to go out and till the land and live communally and all of that. So I think it's very attractive. 
Um, so between 33 and 36, you get a lot of uh, young people, but also older Zionists, you know, people in their 30s and 40s who had been planning to go and went and, and kept pushing the British, but the British were really upset also because of the balance between the Arab population and the Jewish population. So, yeah. Yeah, the question is, did Jews ever illegally, try to illegally emigrate? Um, I have a new project, and it's, I'm looking at the city of Lisbon, and I call it the port of last resort because there are a lot of people, Jews and non-Jews, sitting in Lisbon, the last port after the Nazis have taken over almost all of Europe, right? So they're trying to get out. And about half, the estimate is about half of those people got there illegally. So that means that they... Um, they had to get out of France, they needed an exit visa. They had to get through Spain, that means they needed a uh, transit visa. They couldn't get into Portugal unless they had a transit visa to go to the United States or England. But it means that somehow they got the French and they got the Spanish, but they never got the Portuguese and they snuck over the borders because a lot of those were illegal. Also, refugees entering Brazil and Argentina, a lot of those were illegal too. They came over other borders. So yeah, people did try. But, you know, you, and I would say huge numbers, say in t maybe 10, 20,000, but, you know, scattered here and scattered there. And then all the kids that were hidden, that's all, of course, all, that, all of the hidden children are illegal because they weren't supposed to be alive, right? That's all illegal. Hiding is illegal. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. Of course, the Germans were both pushing Jews to leave and then making it extremely difficult for them to leave. It's, uh, you know, it was a catch-22. On the one hand, we want you out. On the other hand, we'll take all your money so you can't go out. Or on the one hand, um, you better leave very soon. And on the other hand, you have to sell everything. And uh, it's not our problem if you get your visa or not. So, you know, it just, it was really, really hard. And they put a huge tax on them. The... Oh, it's a long name in German. It's, a, it's called the Reich flight tax in English. You know, if you were going to flee, you had to pay an extra tax on top of all the other stuff. And you had your money in a bank account. And the, every couple of months, the value of the money went down because they raised the value of the mark against the foreign money. So, of course, it was, it was more and more impossible. Yeah. Oh, you're thinking of Rosenstrasse. There is this one, one protest. One, not two, one. <laughs> it was um, February 43, or 42. When was Stalingrad? 40, 42 to 43, so it's February 43. Um, the, the question was, was there a women's resistance at one point? Were there demonstrations? There's this one demonstration in Nazi Germany against the deportation of the Jews. I'm not saying there were no demonstrations, although I don't, this is not a big thing in German history that there are a lot of demonstrations during the Nazi period, but um, there are different kinds of things. In, there are work stoppages. There are work slowdowns. There are no real demonstrations. Tim Mason, German historian, um, actually a British German historian, has written about those work slowdowns, uh, sick in calls, things like that, but not really demonstrations. But there's one demonstration, and it's a great, it's become a great film. It, the film is called Rosenstrasse. It's really worth seeing. You might even have it in your library. Um, it's the non Jewish wives of Jews who were about to be deported. And they were brought to a building in Berlin called Rosenstrasse, the Rosenstrasse Street. And today there is a beautiful uh, memorial or monument to them, and it's women and children. It's just very well done, kind of a modern sculpture. And they stood outside, and the film shows this, they stood outside for days and days and said, we want our husbands back. And the Nazis brought the husbands back. And it's fascinating because 
Um, it's important that it has to do with Stalingrad because the question was why? Why did the Nazis buckle? They could have shot these women. Um, but the, gr the crowd grew bigger and bigger every day, and there were men in uniforms in the crowd, too, in, in army uniform, because all of these intermarriages were intermarried deeply and broadly with non-Jews, with, quote, Aryans. So that whole, that whole demonstration out there was Aryans um, demanding their Jewish loved ones back, male loved ones. So it was women on the outside and the men on the inside. Um, I would recommend that film. It's very powerful. And it's by a famous German filmmaker, Margareta von Trotta. So if any of you are film majors, you would enjoy seeing it from that perspective, too. Also, another time among the Jewish population in the early stages of France and Canada, the Nazis were not really in some sense. Okay, was there, was there a way that Jews could have politically tried to form coalitions to influence politics? And the answer is no. I mean, the socialists couldn't do it, the communists couldn't do it, the liberals couldn't do it. Why should one expect the Jews to do it? They, I mean, what, it depends what you mean by did they try. There were many courageous Jewish lawyers who fought for clients in court and sometimes won. So there was that kind of resistance, but you would, I would consider that more legal uh, and sometimes wound up in, ca in concentration camps themselves. They didn't always fight for Jews. They sometimes fought for trade unionists or for Labor Party members, uh, not Labor, Social Democrats. So there, were, there was that kind, but there was, there was, I mean, the one thing the Jewish community did as a whole was it organized itself into a unit. Jews are very anarchic, and they generally don't organize that way. And so there were hundreds of little communities, and when the Nazis came to power, they wanted to deal with one Jewish, like, Fuhrer, so to speak. And, um, and so the Jews Jews, main Jewish organizations all came together and said, okay, now we're gonna have, like, a board of directors, an umbrella organization over everything. They're gonna deal with um, social welfare and with education and culture, and with emigration, and representing Jews to the government. So there were like official people, Leo Beck, for example, who had to go and face the Nazis and say, is it possible for you, for, you, know, for you to be more lenient here? But there was no kind of coalition in terms of fighting. So there was that kind of, you know, there was that kind of political maneuvering, which worked a little, but not really a lot. Okay, there was one other thing I was just thinking when you, well, I forgot. Yes? I'm wondering if you could say something about, um, particularly with German Jewish women, the relationship to text, for example, production of poetry or efforts made to preserve library collections of poetry and fiction, just the whole relationship to, of the printed word to the persecution that was taking place. That's a really very interesting question, and there is some research beginning on that. There was a nice article uh, a few years ago, and I could probably remember the person um, and give you the name, about a library that was set up in Theresienstadt, which was one of the concentration camps. Because some of the Jew many of the Jewish families, you know, they only could take one suitcase. They took their favorite books, or favorite book or two, and so there was like a, thousands of, of volumes in this library. And there's a nice article about that um, in the Leo Beck yearbook about that library. So that was very, you know, that was one. And now there's work being done about people, American Jews going back to Germany after the war to find books, you know, books that hadn't been burned, that books that hadn't been destroyed, and to bring them to different places in the United States and in England, all over the world where there were still Jews, but not leave them in Germany. So there is that in terms of the text. In terms of poetry, I am sure there is something, but I don't know it. I mean, I, there's no, no, nobody springs to mind Nellie Sachs, you know, the obvious Elsa Lasker Schuler, but they don't really write. She, Nellie Sachs writes about the Holocaust. I don't think Elsa Lasker Schuler did. Um, she dies, right? She, 
she writes these amazing letters. Does she? Okay, that I don't know, but she writes these amazing letters uh, before she is deported. So yeah, maybe in poetry also, it's very possible. But I don't know anybody else. But she's, she's a, an important name. After the war, Hilda Domine uh, writes uh, poetry, but she goes back to East Germany, and so it, her poetry then is not about the Jewish uh, fate as much. But she was in the Dominican Republic, so she wrote really f uh, uh, very sweet poems about the Dominican Republic, too. One more question? Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I uh, noticed you mentioned a uh, female doctor and a female psychologist, uh, both Jewish. So I was wondering if those were like kind of outliers or if that was more of a common thing for to see women in kind of elite professions like that. And also if there was a difference between Jewish uh, women in those professions and Aryan women in those, in those professions. That's a very good question. In fact, it helps me answer your question. That was one of the things I forgot, which is, we're coming, this period is coming out of the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic was extremely progressive in terms of women. It wasn't just, you know, uh, Charleston as it was here, but it was women in uh, universities, women in the medical field, far more women proportionately in Germany in medicine than in the United States at that time in medicine. Uh, same thing in psychology, same thing in dentistry, and same thing in law, but in law, they couldn't actually practice law. They could go to law school in 1908. German universities opened only in 1908, okay? So women could only go to university in 1908. They could go to law faculties. They could graduate as lawyers, but they couldn't practice because the government wouldn't let them practice because women couldn't be lawyers until 1918. And so some of those women lawyers became journalists or teachers or social workers, and others, after 1918, became lawyers. So I would say that Weimar women were very liberated, Jewish and non-Jewish. Um, Jewish women were a larger, I said they were 1%, under 1% of the population, they were a much larger percent in the university world. And that has to do also with class, they were mostly middle class, um, and it has to do with the urban, they lived in uh, cities and uh, students in Germany lived in cities with their parents. They didn't go off to campuses and live, you know, in dormitories. So, um, or some of them did actually, but they did. There were no dormitories. They would live with, you know, in pensions and things like that. But the women generally stayed at home. So, uh, because Jews were urban and middle class, there was a higher proportion of women in the universities. But they were very liberated. And then they get to the United States in the 1950s with the feminine mystique. And, and they go to the Rockefeller Foundation, for example, which was trying to help male doctors get back on their feet. And these women doctors would say, well, I would like to get back on my feet. And they'd say, well, why don't you become a social worker? And then they would write in their notes, the, the, the people who were you know, interviewing, you know, these women are very uppity. They think they should become doctors. Well, they had been doctors. And a lot of those women never became doctors again. They became psychologists. Um, they became, one of them had a health column on a radio program in German, you know, and things like that. But a lot of them didn't make it again. So actually, um, going from Weimar, 1920s Weimar, you know, sexual revolution, everything in the 20s, to like puritanical 1950s America was quite a, a, an eye-opener for them. There's a good book on that. It's called When Biology Became Destiny, Women in Weimar and Nazi Germany. It's worth looking at. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You were all very good questioners.